Hey, thanks for downloading the podcast. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. We're going to get right to work because we are loaded with a lot of good content here. In a bit, Steve Palazzolo, who does a lot of the work for Pro Football Focus, you may have seen some of his work. Uh, it, Pro Football Focus essentially is a company that Chris Collinsworth bought into, and Chris is going to be here with us in a second. Uh, and Chris now runs. It's a really fascinating look at the stats and the data of football. And with all this offense and all these points, I, I wanted to give a good sense of how historically it's impacting the game and then what are some of the neat stats and the things you can look for that teams are looking for as they look at the analytics of football and how this year has really been a feels like a sea change in the National Football League with offense and analytics and aggressiveness with coaches. So Steve will give us some of the data behind that in a little bit. But first, the 8,000-time Emmy Award winner and our good friend, Sunday Night Football analyst Chris Collinsworth begins the podcast. And we are joined by the aforementioned Mr. Collinsworth. What 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 is a, what is a week in the life of Chris Collinsworth like uh, during football season? It's fantastic when you're doing Thanksgiving games for me. <laughs> you're funny. <laughs> you're funny. You're funny. I, I was trying to remember the last time I had a Thanksgiving off. I honestly could not remember when it was. Either we were doing games or doing a studio show or right. doing a you know, a HBO or a Showtime show. It's like I, I've always had something going on, so it was just bizarre. And I'm sitting there just watching you guys, and you put Al and I in those wife beater shirts, eating turkey legs, and I did, still didn't care. I was that, really, really okay with the whole thing. Here's the great thing. That's very generous use of the word we. You know exactly who's to blame, and you know we have no fingerprints on that. And I'm sure that the people, <laughs> the people who were responsible heard about it when you saw them last weekend. <laughs> uh yeah we blame michelle it was all <laughs> good answer good answer so so tell folks what what is your uh what is your week like in in preparing for uh let's say we get chargers steelers this week and you've seen the steelers i don't think you've done the chargers what what what's your week no. like how you get ready did you ever see the movie groundhog day yep that's it <laughs> the same thing every single week. Monday night, I start watching film of this week. It was the Chargers. Tuesday, I will do film all day. And then Wednesday, I do film until about noon. I'm running a little late because there's a grandbaby in my life now I went to have breakfast with. That's awesome. Um, and then I start converting over all the PFF stats and the, the Elias stats and then uh, trying to memorize names and specific data on the guys. And it just kind of, it's the same thing every week. I mean, literally you can say, where are you on Thursday at, you know, four o'clock. And generally I can pretty much tell you what I'm doing. Well, you mentioned PFF pro football focus. You see the rankings at the bottom of the screen when the guys introduce themselves on Sunday night football, the players introduce themselves. And that is a company that you're involved with and I'm curious how it has changed your view of football as we've gotten into the analytics world with pro football. You know, one, it's great because I don't have to do all the work anymore. I can, <laughs> you know, I've got, I've got 500 employees, so I'm getting pretty good at dishing it out. You know, it's sort of like being home with the honeydew list. I give them my honeydew list now. So uh, that's, that's definitely helped. But I, I think I think some of the um, – you know the algorithms that, that, that and the math behind the decisions to go for it on fourth down and and how how much more aggressive, according to purely the math, um, that coaches should have been over the years, and I think we're starting to see coaches really change. I, I, I mm-hmm. think it in some ways PFF and in some ways. Um, what Doug Peterson did last year with the Philadelphia Eagles uh, has made coaches has made life tougher on coaches um, because the math says that they really have been punting too much, not going for it in the red zone enough, and not going for it on fourth down enough. Uh, possession is about twelve times a game, and if you easily give away possession, then it's a problem. You know, you go back to the the play that Andy Reid had a couple of weeks ago against Seattle where he didn't go for it on fourth down and two. Well, he never got the ball back. Uh, and I think rightly that one was, was second guess because they were down three 
And even if they had had gotten the ball back, they still had to they still had to go down the field. But the difference between hunting the ball and giving up possession or giving up possession on fourth and two uh, was basically no difference whatsoever, especially down three, because even you still had to get a stop, even if they kicked a field goal, now you're down six, but you still would get the ball back to Aaron Rodgers. And, and because they never got that opportunity, there was a lot of discussion about that play. And I, I mean, I've got two guys in my company that were math professors. I mean, that, that's what they did in college. Uh, and data and statistics and all that. And it came out pretty clear on that one that, um, you know, that he should have gone for it. Um, and I asked, I asked McCarthy about it. Would you do anything differently in that situation? And he said, well, hell yeah, now. And I know yeah. we're going to make it or get the ball back. So, but, but I think that's been the most interesting part of it. And, and, and that's, that's the interesting part, Chris, because it takes us a while to change what we felt for a long time. I'll, I'll give you a four example. I'm watching the Sunday night game with you and Al in the fourth quarter. We finished the studio this past week. We finished the studio, get back to the hotel. And so Minnesota's up 10. Green Bay has it fourth and two, or they have it fourth and two at the Green Bay seven. So it's a chip shot field goal. Even in this world where more kickers are missing 40 plus, it's a chip shot field goal. It's closer than an extra point easily. And they go for it. It's incomplete. It remains a 10-point game. And both you and Al were convinced this is the right move. Go for it. Because if you go for it and you keep going with another drive, you really crush them. But in the old-school mentality, I'm thinking kick a field goal, it becomes a 13-point game instead of a 10-point game. But it feels like all of a sudden in the last 18 months, all that old-school thinking is getting, not thrown out the window, but really examined very closely. And at the end of the day, the probability was right. They should have gone for that a little bit more than kick a field goal and go up 13. Well, you know, I remember the game back in when we did Indianapolis uh, uh, a few years ago and when uh, we saw Belichick go for it on that fourth and two. Right, right. And everybody was aghast at that one, right? That's right. But to get back to the one you're talking about in the Minnesota game, you know, they don't kick the field goal. They don't pick it up. So they're up 10. But now all of a sudden they put together a drive, Green Bay does, and they go down and kick a field goal. Now it's a ten, Now it's a seven-point game trying the onside kick, whereas if they had kicked the field goal, it would have been a 13-point game, and it would have been one of those, well, all right, they, you know, that field goal did, did make a difference. So, exactly. there's, you know, we're, we're talking about nuances here. We're talking about degree here. But, you know, as far as what is what puts the game away or what is the best strategy uh, from a pure percentage standpoint, you know, you can really narrow that down now. And sometimes it's a 52-48 call. Right. You know, now you're really sitting there with your gut. And remember, the coaches don't have access to this. Now, I'm sure the rule is you can't have the algorithms and the computers in the booth. Now, what you can do is pre-print almost as many scenarios as you want so somebody up there could know what you should do. Uh, But for me, it's really easy. I plug in who the two quarterbacks are uh, because that's a big part of it. Uh, I plug in the down, the distance, the time, the quarter, uh, all that different stuff, and it just spits it right back to us. Wow, uh, which is which is pretty cool at this point. It, it really is, and and, and uh, to to talk about the pro football focus stuff, the PFF stuff, which I think, other than grading the players, every play of every player in every game, and it, it's in college too, not not just the pros. What's fascinating to me now is that old school coaches are facing this challenge, and baseballs have the same deal. Do you understand the analytics? Can you apply them because it's counter to what you've always thought, and it's beyond the fourth and two that you're talking about, Chris. It's going to get to personnel decisions that teams make as they're in their off season and examining what players did in each scenario. And football was never looked like that, but looked at that like in this way before, which I think is really cool to watch the evolution. And and your your hands are right there in the middle of uh, of making all this stuff, which is pretty fascinating, I would imagine. Yeah, unfortunately, it means I've got to hire more math guys because they're way more expensive than the other guys. But, <laughs> is that right? You know, the football it's, guys? It's, you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a much harder deal right there. I wish I'd have studied harder in school now. <laughs> 
<laughs> but uh, you know, it, it, it's it's really interesting to me, and you know, it's like the old money ball thing. It was right. who would have ever thought before analytics that on base percentage was going to be such a huge part of baseball, right? I mean, every, you just look for the guy with the best batting average. Well, if the guy with the best batting average struck out the other two times that he didn't get a hit, you know, that's not very good. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, now what is it? Now it's it's you either hit a home run or who cares, you know, exactly. I and mean, that's really what the math is starting to say now. So I, I don't know. I, I just find the thing, the whole thing really intriguing. I, I don't think it'll ever become robotic. Uh, there will always be, and I think there's a human factor to the whole thing too. Um, and, and the human factor is the choke factor on fourth down. You know, it, it's not like it's second and eight. And if you, if you drop the pass or throw a, a bad ball, that you just go on to third down and try it again. This is fourth down. This is usually game on the line. This is the deciding point. moment. And so there is, you know, nerves play a part. And we've seen, you know, missed throws. Even Aaron Rodgers missed one against Seattle up there uh, in, a, in a key moment. So, you know, there, there, are, there are other things that I think we'll continue to discover about this as we go along and, and evolve with it. But it's it's been a fun first step. You're uh... – You've kept a close hand tied towards college football and kept an eye on it over the years here. We're watching college football's spread principles and the way the ball's thrown around come into the NFL. Is it good for pro football? I think it's fantastic for pro football. I, I, I really do. Um, I, I grew up on the wishbone uh, offense, and, and that's what I did. And, in college, I was a quarterback my freshman year until Steve Spurrier came in and kicked me out because he went, went to a drop back style uh, <laughs> of passing game. But if you're good at what we're now calling the RPOs and the read options and all that kind of stuff, and I've talked to many defensive coordinators this year, and you know we're talking about well points are way up and what's going on, and you know now you don't have to have one of those eight guys to have a chance to win. You know, it used to be if you didn't have somebody that could win from the pocket, and, and again, the math makes sense, right? If you're standing in the middle of the field and you can attack 53 yards wide and 60 yards down the field, that's the most square footage that you can possibly attack if you have a great quarterback that can do that. Right. But now what's happened is that we've got these guys, even if they don't have the great arm, they can still be great sort of read option players Mm -hmm. uh, and RPO players because they're smart or they're athletic or they can really run or they can scramble or they can do something else. And I think the idea that we've now maybe moved from six, seven, eight quarterbacks that could win the Super Bowl every year into more of the 12 to 14 quarterbacks that might be able to because of these various styles makes the game a lot more interesting. From where you sit watching the games up in the box with Al, how how significant has it been the throws that quarterbacks can make and not feel guilty about? Because there was a time when you could not throw a ball to a certain spot because you'd get your receiver injured. And it seems like, Chris, there is far, far, and you lived it, God, there's far, far less of that now in the NFL. And I just wonder how much that, on top of the other stuff we were talking about, is the reason that we see 45, 50 points in an NFL game and we don't blink anymore. A a huge, a huge part of it. Um, Because uh, let's start with the quarterback. I mean, at one point, I I remember playing uh, with Kenny Anderson, and there was a shot on our replay board one time with Kenny Anderson's head facing north and his face facing south. I mean, they took his head and ripped it around the other way. You know, and now you can't hit him in the head. You can't hit him in the knees. Right. You can hit him in the back and the stomach and, uh, okay, thank you very much. Same thing goes with receivers. Now, the receivers, you can't you put that that kill shot in anymore. That one where if you throw it up over the middle and you hit me with your helmet right underneath my chin, I'm going to sleep. Right. You know, and so now people that weren't very brave at quarterback or wide receiver are all of a sudden plenty brave enough because they don't mind getting hit in the in the back or the ribs or the the hamstring or any of those things because you can't do the other stuff. 
Hmm. So I, I think that we're bringing more athletes into the game than there's ever been. And let's face it, the gloves are making a huge difference too. I mean, I'm so glad the guys you said are making that. catches now. I've never even heard of it. Right. The one that always struck me is they're running full speed and reaching upside down around their knees with their hands, and the ball is just sticking, and they're not breaking stride. I mean, when I was playing, that was a catch I had never seen, and it was also one that you kind of had to do a hook slide to catch and get your body underneath it, Sure. and that was, you know, you were down, so you weren't getting an explosive play out of that thing. Uh, we're seeing a lot more slants because people can't get their head taken off on those plays. You're seeing offensive linemen that literally can wrap both arms around the outside of shoulder pads and not be called for holding. Um, so there's a lot of things that are cranking up the points. And, and But I think the number one thing that's made this the best year in the NFL this year, I don't think the commissioner's had a press conference yet. He hasn't said I mean, a word. There hasn't not- been that, that moment where, you know, we're all talking about something other than football. So it feels like we've been talking about football all year. And i got to give you credit. You said during the, during the offseason, if, he, if it's just about football, you got people talking about the games, it's a far different – it's a more likable product. And people feel really good about spending their Thursday, Sunday, Sunday night, Monday night with the NFL. And that's exactly what's happened. And people are doing – can you tell people, Chris, because you were a really, really good receiver – uh, you, I'm sure you've put on the gloves uh, to, to catch some balls. Can you just tell people what the difference is uh, with gloves on and back in your day when you didn't have these gloves to, with that adhesiveness to them? Well, you know, the funny thing you say that, I really haven't put these things on yet. But oh, I, I, at the end of my career, the gloves had gotten to the point where I was like, well, let me try these things. So I had never worn gloves in a game other than that freeze bowl game that I did play in right. um, back in whatever it was, 81, One. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in the championship game. But it, now the, the gloves have gotten to the point where, you know, the ball is obviously sticky. Now, I was at some intermediate point in there, and sure. but in 1988, before the Super Bowl, we were playing in Miami, so it wasn't even a cold thing. And we, we had two weeks to get ready for the game. And I said, I'm just going to stick these gloves on one day and go out and, and see what happens. I go out there, and the ball literally just sticks. Now, I don't know if you've ever played racquetball before, mm-hmm. yeah. but it'd be like playing racquetball with or without a glove right. because the leather sticks to leather kind of thing. Yep. Uh, and so you, you're not – the catch is like an afterthought, whereas before the catch was everything. And you saw many more sort of underhanded uh, catches taking place and now everything's almost an overhand catch. It's interesting. I, I've I got to tell you, you got to throw a pair on and try. So you you know Doug Flutie is still uh, still a gym rat and quarterback at heart. So Doug, every time every time we're in South Bend, Doug has to pick up a football and throw it. Y- your son Jack knows that all too well with Doug. So I put on gloves. Chris is the most ridiculous thing ever. Like I I'm not I'm not very good at catching a football. I caught everything. I could hold the football with my small really? with with one hand just at the point with just my thumb and index finger. You you, you got to try it. It helped me appreciate how much the gloves have changed the wide receiver position. And Doug would point out the quarterback position on cold days or wet days. And at the end of the day, while it may be unfair in some eyes compared to the past, it makes a far more entertaining product. Because when you see everybody try to be Odell Beckham, and take the original and take it to the next level, it's awesome. I mean, it's just like your reaction when that play happened a few years ago. It's a wow moment, and we see them once a week everywhere, and it's it's just cool for viewers, and it keeps the entertainment part of this thing going at a high level. At least, at least that's what I feel. So I, I totally agree with you. You know, and and some people have asked me, you know, do you do you you know wish you had played in this era? And you kind of think, yeah, a little bit. But, I mean, you know, that's the thing that I think is so hard about comparing eras is that, you know, Lynn Swan and John Stallworth, I mean, would they? I think Lynn Swan had under 400 catches and made the Hall of Fame, and John Stallworth was around 500. Uh, And now you don't even get a glimpse unless you're (laughs) over 1,000. Exactly. You know, I mean, the game is just just completely changed. But it was was a – you know, no, the middle linebackers now are sprint champions, and 
you know, every, everything is a little bit, but it was fun. I mean, I really liked our game. I, I, I liked the way we played it. Uh, but as an announcer, I love what's going on with the passing game because I, I say wow about eight times a game. Um, yes. and, and I, I agree with you. I think it is, I think it's a turn on for the fans too. I think you get a little bit of that, that, uh, Cirque du Soleil kind of thing going on out there with the field and it makes you admire these guys even more. I always told people the reason Tiger Woods ratings were great compared to other golfers, one, he won all the time, but every time he was over the ball, there was a chance that you were going to see something that you haven't seen before. And with these passing offenses and the catches that all these guys make, whether it's A.J. Green or Beckham or Julio Jones, I'm not leaving guys out, just you know the, you know the genre I'm talking about, there's a wow factor to it, and we love to see for the first time something that we hadn't seen before and can say, wow, I was watching that game, I remember that. So I, I, th- I think it all factors in. All right, before we let you go, uh, the best three or four teams that you've seen as you've not just watched – but when you study film, you get to see the other side, the, the other teams. Who were the best as we hit the three-quarter pole here? Well, first of all, if you want to see something you've never seen before in golf, they should watch you and me play. <laughs> that, every every swing will give you one of those. That's so. for darn sure. That's... <laughs> <laughs> you, may, you may see the ball go in directions you've never seen it before. That's right. <laughs> well done. <laughs> But, um, but you know, as far as the teams, you know, and, and I think the big three are, are relatively obvious, right? Mm-hmm. We know that the Saints and the Rams and the Chiefs are, are having special years. Right. But I, I think there are teams to keep your eye on. Okay. Uh, obviously, the Steelers and the Patriots always seem to find a way, even when they have missteps a long way, to, to stumble into the mix. But I always say, watch out for the defensive teams. You know, we're heading into that that colder championship kind of thing here. Um, and, you know, teams like the Texans and the Ravens and the Cowboys and the Bears, you know, some of those teams that can really play defense, uh, the Vikings, I think, are, are in that mm-hmm. mix a little bit too. You know, even Carolina and Seattle. But it, it, it's it, it, it's always the one that sneaks through. You know, there's always something. You think about the Final Four last year with Minnesota uh, getting in there, with Jacksonville getting in there. There's There are hot offenses, but there are also hot defenses, and I think those are the ones that we tend to ignore. And then you go, okay, of those ones with the, the hot defenses, you know, who is it that has a chance? Right. Um, the, to turn things around on, and get better and better on offense. And I think Houston fits into that category a little bit. Uh, Chicago seems to, to be improving. Uh, Dallas seems to be improving a little bit. Uh, and, and really the great wild card right now is probably what Frank Reich is doing it with the Colts. <laughs> it's exactly I mean, the right. Colts right now, are they've been scoring points all year. But it's just been lately that their defense is kind of catching up a little bit and giving them a chance. So um, I, I, I tend to think this is a little more wide open than people think. I think the one clear favorite is are the Saints just because, you know, they're one of those those elite one-loss teams, and they've got that veteran Super Bowl champion quarterback that's been through it before. But after that, I, I really nothing would surprise me. And, I, and I'm anxious to see the L.A. Chargers this week. Yep. You know, I think if the Chargers go in there and somehow knock off the Pittsburgh Steelers, we're all going, wait a minute. I, I never even factored them into this thing. That's exactly right. Um, and, and, and they likely are going to put up a pretty good performance this week. And, and you said it, too, in, as we wrap up. You said the one thing that I think is the most fascinating part of this. We're in this era now where we're expecting those elite offensive teams to score 35 or 40. Can you do it in December? Can you do it in January? It, it can be cold in Kansas City. If the Rams have to go on the road for some reason, will they be able to do that? And obviously not in the Dome. But those are the fascinating things about where you play these games over the next three or four weeks. Other than the Patriots, everybody else seems to be weather susceptible in the past. Let's see, let's see what happens this year. All right, Chargers and Steelers, Sunday Night Football with Al, Chris, and Michelle. And then uh, the following week, the Rams and the Bears, two of the teams Chris just mentioned. So it's going to be fun here along the way. As always, good talk to you about football forever. You are the best. Thank you very much, man. All right, buddy. Good talk to you. 
our thanks to Chris. And now we're going to transition to one of the guys working on Chris's team, one of the top uh, senior analysts at Pro Football Focus, Steve Palazzolo. Okay, Chris and I were talking about uh, PFF and Pro Football Focus during that time. Steve Palazzolo joins us. Steve, you need to give me your title because I, I've, I've run out of uh, space on my paper here for what your title <laughs> is there at PFF. I added something. So I'm, I'm generally a senior analyst because I've been doing this thing for, for a little while now, uh, but now director of all of our video content. So I had to add that to the mix. I, I need to fit both parts in, senior analyst and director of our video content. All, all of the above. And uh, you, you'll see Steve uh, from time to time, whether it's on uh, NFL Network, doing some stuff, or also some uh, terrific on PFF site. Uh, I feel like I'm selling PFF here, and I am because I, 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 use, I use it so often. I use it for the college stuff and the pro stuff, and it's really helped me see the analytics game. And Chris and I were talking about this, Steve. You get into football games, and we've been trained for 30 years, fourth and two at your own 40, punt the ball away, or maybe at, at midfield, punt the ball away, make them go the long field. Where where historically did this sea change begin to happen that people started to look at the math of it and say, you know what, we might have a better chance of winning the game if we go for it here and keep our possession as opposed to giving the ball to the other team so freely? Yeah, I think over the last you know 10 to 15 years, there's been a lot of people who have looked at this um, – you know, from from an analytics standpoint, and, and I don't know that what we're doing at PFF, um, you know, encouraging teams to go for it on fourth down uh, much more often is anything that's necessarily groundbreaking. But um, you know, we're hoping that we have the NFL's ear a little bit more than than some others because we do have all 32 teams as clients. So I do think um, we're helping to bring more awareness to look the traditional, some of the traditional thoughts around football are good and other ones just need to be explored a little bit more. And I think you know, when it comes to that aggressiveness on fourth down and a couple other parts of the game, uh, you know, I think there's always room to evolve. And the thing I always come back to, and, you know, since I've been with PFF since 2011, I think the, th- the thing we come back to when we defend ourselves, so to speak, and say, hey, this, this is why our grade matters. Here's why you should focus on PFF grades. Is I think a lot of people in football, it's such an emotional sport. It's such an emotional game and people are, tied to what they know um, but I do think the best NFL coaches the best you know front office personnel people are going to be the ones that can separate emotion from you know finding the facts so to speak finding uh, you know the right information to move forward and I think that we're you know in that realm right now we're getting more head coaches who are willing to break the mold a little bit you get more front office people who are willing to break the mold and start to think outside the box a little bit more. Steve let's talk specifically about the analysis that teams are doing and teams get get a variety of sources and information but and information but i think what folks might not realize is that every team in the nfl has pretty much grown over the last i don't know decade probably a little bit less their own analytics group much like baseball teams have so how has that influenced in your conversations how has that influenced the decisions they make not just on fourth and two at the at the 48 yard line But the decisions they make in the draft room in April, the decisions they make in free agency in March, how much has the analytics become a key part of molding a team? I think it's huge now. Here's the most interesting thing, though. You know, we we go to the NFL Combine, and that's kind of our state of the union with our 32 NFL team clients. We sit down with each team, and we say, okay, what what do you like? What do you don't like? How are you using our data? How are you doing all these different things? And what you find is uh, all 32 teams are at very – different levels of i don't want to use the word competence but you know they they use things differently they have different focuses so um to me that was the most eye-opening thing it's not just you know every team's doing x you know every team's got different ways of doing things but there's but there's but there's something there's a lot of data going into weekly game planning you know coaches uh love having this information that they used to have to dig up by hand and all of a sudden it's you know on their desk 6 a.m monday morning and, you know, half of their morning work is already done and they can focus on the coaching aspect of things. So, yeah, I think we're helping to make teams more efficient from a mm. game planning standpoint. They're more efficient from, uh, you know, draft capital standpoint. You know, I think there's a lot of studies being done on, you know, do you trade up? How much do you want to trade down? Is it better to accumulate picks versus going up and getting one pick? I think there's a lot of good research that points to, yeah, more picks are always better. Um, and, and just like in baseball where, it went from, you know, just one team was going to find guys who were good at getting on base. Uh, all of a sudden, all 32 teams were, were doing the same thing. 
I think we'll find in the NFL draft, a lot of teams, you know, a lot of research says trade down. So where are you going to find a trade up partner? You know, so I think it's going to be really interesting (laughs) to see how the strategy evolves as more teams get the same information, maybe draw some of the same conclusions and then others, you know, use things differently and and find a different strategy. But it's just more information to, to make better decisions. And we're definitely seeing it all across the game. What's the offensive trend this year? Because we, we see the points, we see the yards, we see all this stuff. What's the offensive trend that has caught your eye through the first dozen weeks of the NFL season? I, I think there's, there's two, basically. I think when you look at the way defenses, uh, they always say the NFL is a copycat league. So we're five or six years removed from the Seattle Seahawks running that cover three, cover one scheme, mm. get those long corners, and run the same basic scheme over and over again. Now you see teams like Atlanta and the Chargers and uh, San Francisco, a lot of teams are just like, hey, we're going to run cover three, cover one. We're going to build that same thing. And offenses have, good at, are, have been good at finding the, the passing concepts to beat that coverage, so to speak. So you, I think Chris mentioned it on Sunday night, the deep over route right. behind the linebackers, in between the safeties. We see seam routes. We just see offenses that are better at attacking some of the base coverages around the NFL. And then I think it's just the eye candy in the running game. You know, college about – 10 years ago, you know, I think when Cam Newton was, was, was there at Auburn, and you just see there's motion on every single play. There's backs going every which way. There's bubble screens. There's all this different eye candy, but the concepts are basically the same. They're running power. They're running outside zone. I think that's what we're seeing in the NFL right now. There's jet motion. There's you know orbit motion. There's all these different things. There's a lot of jet passes. There's option shovels and you know traditional options. Um, so essentially, I think offenses are getting good at winning the numbers advantage on defense. If you can just move one defender, all of a sudden the run the run play opens up or a pass play opens up. And I think offenses are just getting really good at adding all that extra stuff to keep the defense just off balance enough to open up open throws and open runs. I, I want to ask you about a couple of stats that we talk about that I have a better understanding with with pro football focus. Let's take uh, Drew Brees. We we know the basic number, Drew Brees' completion percentage is on a record pace, his own NFL record. Uh, going into the Thanksgiving game, I, I think I made the point that if he would have – I know I never got it on the air. It was my, my favorite fact that I never got it on the air. If he would have thrown 22 straight incompletions, he still would be ahead of his record pace. That, that's, how good he, that's how good he has been. But you guys have taken accuracy – to another level and just talking about where the pass is on the receiver's body. So maybe you can explain to folks how you describe accuracy and give it a percentage beyond it's a completed pass. Yeah, this is one of my favorite things that we've uh, really developed the last couple of years. Oh, that's good because we, we didn't talk about this. It's, it's one of my favorites and I had no idea, so I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> well, well, this was this was kind of my brainchild, too. I don't know if you knew that. Oh, I, mean, this is, I I've been working on this for years. And, okay. and, and look, I, we, took, we wanted to take the PFF grading system, the play-by-play QB grading system, which I already think is um, the best thing around as far as evaluating quarterbacks, and then take it to the next level. So adding actual ball location data. So how often is Drew Brees hitting a shallow cross actually in stride, hitting a guy with a good catch and run opportunity versus keeping it maybe on his back hip, which would, you know, it's still catchable. It's still going to be a completed pass most likely, but it's not necessarily maximizing yards after the catch. Um, And then, you know, downfield throws, you know, instead of saying, Hey, this is an overthrow. This is an underthrow high passes versus passes behind versus passes up and away from coverage, really just identifying the actual ball location on every throw. And, you know, something like that for Breeze, uh, he was at something like 74% going into that right. game, which is just absurd because we've got three years of data on this now. And we saw Brady at about 70% in 2016. Breeze was up around 70% last year to lead the league. So 74 is the best that we've seen. Uh, and and it's, just, it's just a much better way of, uh, you know, evaluating quarterback accuracy. Completion percentage is really a function of decision-making and accuracy overall. You know, if you throw to more open receivers, you're going to complete more passes, which is valuable, which is good. But the accuracy component, just being able to isolate that and see where a quarterback's accurate, accuracy beyond the sticks is just so valuable. And, you know, you generally see the Drew Breeses, the Tom Brady's, the Aaron Rodgers of the world uh, rise to the top when, we re- when you really dig into that data. So really excited about where we're going uh, you know, with all of our quarterback accuracy numbers and uh, do think it's something that nobody else is really doing. Lastly, Steve, as we get to the final quarter of the season, after the uh, game on Monday night it's in, in the NFC East with Washington and Philly, 
everybody will be three quarters of the way through their season. All the buys are done. Nobody's on a buy this week, so everybody will have four to go. December football always changes for a variety of reasons. One, you have teams that are out of the mix, and they're playing people to see what they've got. Uh, then you have teams that are playing for it all, and they may make some different choices because of where they are in the standings. But I think the other variable is weather, and that is a factor. Over time, how have you seen, and, and this is unfair because you don't have data in front of you, and I, didn't pr- I prep you on this one, have you seen that the passing numbers that I think have just been out of this world this year, do they get impacted significantly by the weather as we get into the December part of the schedule? So, so they do a little bit. I've done a little bit of research on this, uh, more have. from just an overall passing data standpoint, not necessarily from a from a PFF standpoint. But, right. but using the accuracy data um, as an example, uh, QBs are about two percent more accurate in a dome versus outdoors. And then the outdoor factor, of course, you're going to get more of those uh, bad weather games, of course, in December. And it's not just rain and snow; it's wind and right. you know all the variables and the cold. Of course, you know passing numbers in general are going to go down. Uh, in those outdoor games because receivers don't catch as well and all that fun stuff. So um, the thing that I found, and not to take anything away from Drew Brees and how well he's played this year, but even if you just look at his career splits from a pure passing stats standpoint, his passer rating drops about 10 points from indoor to outdoor games. Now, granted, he played a lot of outdoor games you know, in San Diego when he was with the Chargers, and there are always going to be road games for him and all that stuff. But um, essentially what I found is that road quarterbacks in domes actually put up better stats than home quarterbacks outdoors if that all makes sense so yes, you know Drew sure. Brees has you know Tom Brady could put up better stats playing in the Superdome than he does at home if he played 16 games in each you know so um, the good weather does affect the passing stats and of course the better you know, there's always better weather early in the season so I do expect long story short I do expect passing stats to come down a little bit but then you have you know the Drew Breeses and Matt Ryans of the world can still put up big numbers in December because they've got uh, so many indoor games to play. But I do think it's a factor in the teams that can mitigate it the most, That can, it's because it's still all about the pass game, the teams that can still find a way to throw the ball um, even when the weather is going bad. I think those are the teams that are going to be better. Traditional thought is, hey, you have to run the ball, but ultimately this, this league is going to be decided by the passing games uh, on both sides, on offense and in coverage. And I think it's a little bit less with New Orleans and Breeze. They have at Tampa, which should be fine, could be wet. They play at Carolina, and then their last two games are at home. And if they are uh, in position to close down number one seed, uh, they they will not play an outdoor game the rest of the year. Right. And they're, the only one they'll play that is even in dicey weather will be an at Carolina game in Week 15. The one I'm really curious about, Steve, is Kansas City. Uh, this Kansas City offense has been so good. We know Kansas City can get walloped with cold days, bitter cold days in December and January. Can they be what the Rams and the Saints and the Chiefs have been all season long if it's 17 and frigid at Arrowhead? Will, will that negate Tyreek Hill's speed? Will it negate Mahomes' ability to throw it all over the lot the way he does? I, I think to me, as I look at uh, late December and January football, that might be the most fascinating aspect of one of those teams that has what it takes to get to the Super Bowl if they can get there or not. I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens there. Well, I'm definitely with you. I mean, the AFC certainly has a lot more elements, right? Out in Pittsburgh, New England, all the different yes. you know places where Kansas City could play. Well, I mean, they're most likely going to be playing at home. But um, I think their, their, their thing is Mahomes has been special within structure and outside of structure. I think Kansas City has – the balance on offense, and when I use the term balance, is the, it's the ability to throw the ball short, intermediate, deep, and run the ball. You know, so that's to me that's balance, mm. and then his ability to play within structure and outside of structure. So, I'd like to think that they have enough weapons to mitigate all of that because they do a good job of scheming open throws, and he does a good job of, uh, you know, making special plays. And then if they do need to rely on Kareem Hunt in the running game, that's there as well. So I, th- I think Kansas City is probably balanced enough. Um, and then, you know, their terrible pass defense maybe comes back, you know, to the rest sure. of the pack because of the weather as well. So um, I think it, it could work, you know, both ways uh, when it comes to the weather there. Glass half full look at it. I, I like that. That is a, that is a very deep approach. Just, and I was, I was going to wrap up with you, but you, you opened a door there that I, I wanted to hit. One, I love your definition of balance because people always think of balance as, 50% run, 50% pass. That's gone. I always thought of balance is I can run when I want to. I can pass when I want to. I can I can take what you're doing or dictate what I'm doing to you and be equally as effective. I, I love the way you broke the balance down even deeper to the short, medium, and long pass uh, in addition to 
the the run game. But the, the, the other the other thing that you mentioned there that that, that kind of caught my eye. I haven't heard people talk much about essentially scripted and unscripted plays. Yeah. And and you when you look at plays when you're grading plays you go do you go and put a separate category on essentially after that first second first second and third uh, seconds of the play have gone you then start to look at what you do in an unscripted play kind of like the Aaron Rodgers after everybody's covered mode and you start scrambling you 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 grade and carry, categorize those a bit differently for your PFF stuff. So, so the yeah, it's a good question. So the grade itself might not change, but the right. the database will end up telling the story. So okay. in Mahomes' case, we can say, okay, I, I, the last time I checked the percentages, he had by far the highest percentage of open throws. Again, going back to some of our QB charting, how open are these receivers? Right. Highest percentage of open throws in the NFL. So that's that's scheme plus decision making. Okay. And then you saw, and then for weeks he's been sitting there with over 200 yards more than the next closest guy when he's outside the pocket. So we do track when a quarterback scrambles left, scrambles right, and makes a throw. And when Mahomes has done that, whether it's on a design roll or a scramble, so to speak, an off, uh, an unscripted play, off script type of play, right. his production is so much higher than every other quarterback in the league. And again, I think that's just what's made him special. I mean, it truly is like taking Alex Smith, who was extremely productive in last year's Kansas City offense with Andy Reid and all those playmakers, and then adding this incredible playmaking ability to it. And that's, I mean, that's been the difference. Alex Smith led the league in passer rating last year. And now you have Patrick Mahomes, who has exceeded those numbers because he just has uh, more skill outside of structure. You know, I mean, I think that's, that's truly been the difference. He has the most big time throws. That's my, my favorite number here. Big, our, our highest graded throws outside the pocket. And it, it's by a wide margin. So, um, yeah, I think our data can kind of separate where quarterbacks are making their throws and, um, the data is definitely pointing to Kansas City's ability to to do both within structure and outside. And when people when coaches get that stuff, then they know okay, we're gonna we we know what's ahead here. We're gonna game plan accordingly. That's where this whole thing yep. is fascinating. Hey, you're the best. I really appreciate your time. I could uh, be educated by your offensive approach forever. It's really fascinating, and for for the listeners to get a little peek of what goes on with planning for NFL game plans on the defensive side. Here's a little uh, little backdoor information on what uh, what goes into it. Steve, we appreciate it. Keep up the great work. Follow him on uh, social media, Twitter. Uh, sign up for PFF if you are a football nerd or if you want the edge in your fantasy league, by the way. This stuff helps a lot, so you can go do that. Thanks, man. I appreciate your time. Thanks a lot, Mike. Appreciate it. Our thanks to Steve and to Chris. Hope you learned a little bit, for those who listened through, of where football is going. Passing, offense, analytics, can it last within this season? Interesting to watch, but long term it is here to stay, and it's affecting every level of football. And hopefully that was a little bit of a informational 45 minutes from two of the guys who are right in the middle of all the data and how it's changing. Thanks to Alex Hardy for putting this together. Thank you for downloading the podcast. We'll see you on TV, and we'll uh, hopefully reconnect with you when you download this very podcast one week from now. Have a great one. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.